Hey there, it's Dr. William Lee, physician, scientist, and author of Eat to Beat Disease. And I'm here with my new video series. It's really a fun thing that I'm doing with my friends and my colleagues. And it's real conversation between two people that you might have seen on a stage or on a program or at a summit. And I, I, what I wanted to be able to do is to, to, to bring people in on the conversations that we really have uh, when we're actually just, you know, ourselves. And so today I'm, I'm super excited to be joined by my friend and colleague, Dr. Stephen Gundry. Um, I, I can't believe anybody would not know who Dr. Gundry is. He uh, is a pioneer uh, in talking about um, uh, the uh, healthy nature of foods and surprises that we actually seen. And recently he has really gotten into one of my favorite, absolute favorite areas, which is olive oil. And so we're going to talk a little bit about this. And so um, uh, Steve, thanks for uh, joining. And I, I thought, you know, as part of sort of like the real conversation, um, I just learned that you came back from the South of France. So uh, I, I'm a big fan of that area of the world. I've traveled there many, many years. I've got lots of good friends there. And one of the things that I love about that part of the Mediterranean is I'm always surprised and delighted by something delicious that I can find there to eat and that's also healthy. So what did you find? Well, tell, me, tell me about your trip. Well, you know, one of the interesting things about uh, both South France and, and Italy, and we spend actually a lot of time in both places, um, I think I have yet to have a salad at a restaurant that didn't have uh, chicory forms of vegetables like radicchio, like treviso, like uh, Belgian endive, like frise and chicory. And, I, I, and I'll bet you that you had the exact same ex experience. And, you know, these guys are, to me, are so important because they contain, you know, an amazing fiber, inulin. And inulin, is, is, as you know, as I know, is so great for your gut microbiome. And it, it's always fascinated me that you, you go anywhere in the South France and Italy, and you're going to find, you know, chicory family of vegetables in in your salad and it's like hey how come every one of these salads has these and, <laughs> and, and then yeah. you start you start looking at the literature and you go oh you know these guys knew this long before you and i knew I, this I, I, i'm telling you that's one of the things i love about the mediterranean is that the foods that you get there at any place not a not necessarily a fancy but any place they use just intuitive combinations of ingredients that have been passed down for generations without a lot of science, but just intuition of what actually works. And I, I love that about good, healthy, fresh eating that, you know, tastes great, right? And, and you know, by the way, like the, the chicories and stuff, you know, they're, they're, it's so much more interesting to eat than just like loose leaf lettuce that you tear up uh and, and yeah. put a little dressing on right uh, oh yeah uh, and you know and they there's an expression that i used that you would back uh, more bitter more better and yeah. you know they they love these you know bitter greens and bitter foods and and brightly colored you know you, you're always eating the rainbow there as you your spouse and i do and it's, it's just you see it in action every day and you're right you don't have to eat it a fancy no and, and so 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 help me understand, like, I'm just picturing this chicory salad you, you, you've eaten over and over again recently. What else goes into it? Tell me about the other stuff in the salad. Well, as, as you well know, um, there's, there's going to be a, a bottle of olive oil on the table ev everywhere you go. And there's usually going to be a bottle of balsamic vinegar or another form of vinegar on the table everywhere you go. And there's actually, you may have noticed this, there's a pecking order depending on how often you go to a restaurant of which olive oil you're going to get. The, oh, is that right? Oh, yeah. The, the touristas, and I know just about every olive oil in France and Italy now, and the touristas will get um, a, a fairly mild olive oil, but kind of the more you show up there, they start bringing out the better they, they stuff. Were, yeah, uh, yeah. They, they, they upgrade you and, you know, and, now, it, gets, and it gets more and you, biting and, you, and, and you more punchy. 
and you can tell by the taste or do they actually give it to you in a different bottle? No, well, you can tell, yeah, the different bottles, but you can really tell by the taste. And, you know, if, if, it, if it makes you cough, as I say, that uh, that's what you wanna, you know, that's, then you know that you're getting all these polyphenols. You, you know, I mean, and that's the other thing is just like what you're talking about, the, 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 the taste sensation of the chicory, the radicchio, it's a little bitter. You've got the bite of the olive oil, sort of the front taste and also the back taste of it. Um, I love the idea of the, the balsamic. Uh, so are there anything else, uh, other things that go into the salads that you discovered this time? Well, you know, uh, a lot of places now, it's surprising me, like we'd be at a ho one particular hotel in uh, Cap Ferrat, and now they have a half sliced avocado as one of the things you can just, you know, pick up um, from, you know, going, going through the buffet. And that's actually fairly new, but, and, and it's drizzled with olive oil and it's got a little sea salt on it. And I go, wow, now I don't even have to, you know, ask for it. Oh, uh, do you happen to have an avocado in the Right, back? right. Well, and you know, like what I, what I love about what you just said is that I can, because I can picture it in my head. It's super simple. Half an avocado, uh, not taken out, little sea salt and olive oil. Like that's all you need. Just take a spoon and that's it. Like yeah. That. It's... So, you know, s simplicity is something that I really appreciate about uh, great food. I just myself got back from, I was in the Mediterranean doing research on my next book and I, uh, I was in Greece and I was looking at what they actually put in a Greek salad, right? So if you go in America, you order a Greek salad, it's kind of a big deal. And then when you look at it, it's kind of like, this looks like any American salad that they threw a couple of olives in. Oh, or, yeah. <laughs> or a couple, and, or a couple and, of chunks of feta cheese. Yeah, that's right. And, and it's probably not actually feta cheese. It's probably made from cow milk. No. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, it was like the first time I ordered it again recently, I looked at it and I thought, you know, this is, this is the real Greek salad. It's elemental. It's got some uh, cucumbers. It's got some um, volcanic tomatoes, just a little slim sliver of red onion. I mean, all these bioactives that are in there, um, some local wild organic uh, oregano sprinkled on there capers from the volcano you know just i mean local stuff brined and put in there you get your quercetin uh all in there and you know like and even if you didn't know any sides which you know obviously you and i it's hard for us to not uh, use our spectacles to look at the scientific goodies yeah but fr right like that's how i navigate my i'm sure you do the same way but honestly it just tastes so damn good yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of those salads over there, they use purslane as yes. part. And, uh, you know, people go, wait a minute, that's the weed that grows on the sidewalk everywhere. Right. It's also, you know, moss rose or portulaca. And I mean, purslane is just one of these other compounds that you go, holy cow, you know, there's, there's all this alpha linolenic acid in purslane yeah. and a great deal of fiber as well. And so you start going, why are you know why are they eating this weed you know what why would you even you know put this weed in your salad and it always you know like you it prompts me to go okay why are they eating this weed and you know that that one of the things that i always look for in a menu when i am doing my research is they call them wild greens the the greek name they call it horta and basically they're they're literally going out more or less along the side of the road or the back of the yard or the hillside and, and just like ripping them out of the ground, cleaning it off and then sauteing it very simply with a little bottle of olive oil, just a little heat, maybe a, maybe a little garlic, maybe some spices and that's it. Like, and they present it to you. It looks as beautiful as if it were, you know, coming out of some fancy restaurant. And, but it's as simple as actually what mother nature delivered. Like literally it could have been from just 10 feet away in a restaurant. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned red onions. It's like, and you see yep. red onions all the time in, you know, in Southern Europe. And it's like, well, okay, why the red onion? Um, why isn't this big slab of white onion that we have, you know, in, in the United States? Well, like you said, you know, there's far more polyphenol bioactive compounds in red onions, plus they're milder and you can, 
you can get that onion taste without <laughs> blowing your mouth open. Right. Well, and you know, the other thing about um, uh, red onions that I've been sort of diving into and doing some research about is, all right, and I, li I like to cook. I don't know about you, but oh, um, yeah. so, so, well, first of all, here's something I learned. Uh, I, um, I happen to know the uh, chief scientific officer uh, that used to work at the USDA, and now he works for a, a, a produce organization, kind of a nonprofit trade organization. And so I asked him, I said, is there something that I should know about food safety that most people wouldn't know? Like, I'm pretty savvy. I think I'm pretty savvy. I like to be in the kitchen. He said, here's the thing. Do you wash your onions? And I'm like, eh, sometimes I do, but usually I don't. He's like, you should definitely wash your onions because that thing's been rolling around in the dust and the ground and, and everywhere else in a truck and in the storage. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? Like wash your onions? Aren't we just peeling off the shell? He said, yeah, but you know, like, Think about it. If you're actually taking a knife and you're peeling off that stuff, you're just introducing the dirt. If you were a surgeon, which you are, I'm not. <laughs> and you are saying like, you know, I'm not going to prep the skin. I'm just going to cut right in with a butter knife. You know, like it's, it's or a knife that it's coming out of, that's coming out of an un, uh, unused dishwasher that, you know, like you wouldn't be doing it. And so I'm like, okay, I get it. So one thing I learned about that is so like rinsing the onion for about 60 seconds. But then the second thing I didn't realize is that a lot of the um, quercetin that's found in the onion. Right. So um, I used to uh, take the, the papery stuff off the onion and then I would just like, you know, usually peel off some chunks on the outside, whatever. And he said, no, no, no. Actually, there's a lot of quercetin on the outer layers. So it's more concentrated on the outer layers and it gets more less concentrated, more dilute on the inside. So now what I do, is not do I wash my onions, but I actually make sure I don't throw away some of the outer layer. So I didn't know that. Did you know that? Good tip. No, no. Yeah. And by the way, if you take a look at the European salad, so this is what I did when I was in Mediterranean, I was looking for what layer they were actually putting in the salad. And mostly it's that outer layer. It's got more pigment to it. Uh, and so I'm like, they actually know, like, right? So again, the same thing is like, I don't know how come we don't know, but they know. Well, because, uh, you know, that's a whole nother subject, but they actually honor their elders and they yeah. honor their, you know, the village elders and their parents and their grandparents and their great grandparents. And, you know, these, these oral traditions are actually passed down from generation. And these wives tales uh, usually have, you know, a very good scientific basis that, yeah. you know, you and I like to discover, but they've known for eons. They don't need to discover. They don't need to discover it because it's been passed down. Right. You know, the fun thing uh, recently, and maybe I did not know this, but I know, particularly in Italy, um, they do eat a lot of beans um, mm -hmm. and they soak their beans for actually a considerable period of time. Like, and how, like, how, like how long? So at least 24 hours. Some of them soak them for 48 hours. And because, yeah, I'll go, we'll go to a little village and find a chef in a little cafe and start talking. Why do you do this? What are you doing? Right, 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 right. And so I've discovered a paper recently that beans, like other things, actually have their own set of yeasts on the individual beans. Hmm. And when you soak them, they ferment. And it ah. turns, yeah. And wow. so- the longer you soak them, the more the fermentation, fermentation process actually breaks down the lectins in beans, one of my favorite subjects. Yeah. And so I said, son of a gun, you know, I, talk, I tell people eat fermented foods all the time. Or, right. And yet I never even thought that the reason they're soaking the beans was to start the fermentation process. And in Fantastic. fact, you see, you see this foam, you know, in the water when you're soaking. And you don't, and you don't think about you it, go, right? Yeah, I don't even think about it. Yeah. son of a gun. And so there's this paper saying, oh, look, there's all these lactobacilli and all these other bacteria that actually ferment the beans for you. And I go, you know, how do these guys get so smart? <laughs> well, you know, I, I think what it is, is that we're using like folks like you and I and the people that we work with, we're using the power and the tools of modern science to basically simply rediscover. It's kind of like an archaeology of sorts, right? Oh, like, yeah. It's been known we are just blowing the dust off the cover and opening it back up to see what was inside, right? 
uh, and having a modern understanding, of course, I, I, I love that. So when you, um, when you are in the Mediterranean, do you, are, are you, do you stick with a purely vegan diet? Are you, what, what other, what other, if not, then what are the goodies that you have? Tell, tell well, me yeah. So, you know, I, I classify myself as a veg aquarian and by, by that, I mean, I, I eat lots of plants, uh, but I actually, on the weekend, my wife and I supplement our diet with wild shellfish and wild fish. And we do that for a purpose. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of a class of phospholipids that uh, make plasmalogens um, that you, I know, are aware of. And one of the best sources of plasmalogens are uh, shellfish, uh, particularly mollusks and bivalves. And it's, it, it's always entertaining to me that these things feature very prominently in, in the cuisine of, of, of the Mediterranean. Um, so and, so what, what, from your perspective, what are, the, what are some of the most um, uh, striking health benefits of that? Okay. Ah, yeah, great question. Well, you know, the, these phospholipids uh, have become very intriguing to me because in, in Alzheimer's research, we know that one of the things that's absent uh, or very sparse in the brain of Alzheimer's patients are this class of phospholipids that are called plasmalogens. And there's been some very elegant studies, particularly in Japan, looking at supplementing the diet um, with uh, plasmalogens from scallops in, in mild cognitive impa impairment patients. And these are the, by the way, these are the big scallops, right? The sea scallops. Yeah, sea scallops. As, as opposed um, to the tiny, tiny. Yeah, not the little base scallops yeah, that you guys yeah, yeah. eat up there. <laughs> uh, but, the, you know, they're also present in all the other shellfish. Um, Another interesting place, speaking of why do people eat these things, are sea yeah. cucumbers. And oh, I love sea cucumbers. Yeah, well, sea cucumbers are a rich source of these phospholipids that we really don't have in our diet anymore. And so, wow. what, what the heck? I, you know, I, I like I like my I like my brain, and you know, I I, I want to why not? Yeah, I want to keep it working. But so, you, now, now, did you eat sea cucumber in the Mediterranean? They no, eaten? they don't. They that's didn't a, serve. That's it. in Asia. Yeah, that's in Asia. But yeah, uh, yeah. But they they use far more uh, shellfish and mollusks. In, in what what and you know what I love um, that you know when I am doing research in the Mediterranean, I love to go to their seafood markets and oh, fish yeah. markets and wet markets. And one thing that always blows me away um, is the diversity and the variety of shellfish that you can't get at home right so we get what do you get you get like steamers and you get mussels and you know a couple of crabs but you know like when you go to these places and you see all these um it's like a shellfish going to a shellfish collector store oh yeah that they're yeah. live whole and and just so mesmerizing to me um like, okay, so a shellfish, how, how do you like to have them cooked? How did you have them eat? Well, it, and again, it depends on where you go, but a lot of times, you know, they'll bring out these towers, like you talked about, and there's like, you know, there's, there's 10 different little cockles and, you know, and, and they give you a little bitty for you know, whelks and they give you these little forks and you go, I'm not going to, you know, how, that's a lot of work. But, you know, it's interesting. It is a lot of work to eat shellfish. You know, we forget how easy we make it for ourselves whenever we're yeah. eating. Oh, I want popcorn shrimp. That'll be good for me. Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> That's true. Or fried chicken in a bucket. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, you give me the chicken it. tenders. <laughs> No, it, it's actually, that's a good, that's a really good point. You know, one of my favorite ways of actually cooking shellfish is um, I learned this from a friend of mine who's a, who's a professional chef. If you have a, just a griddle or a plancha and all you got to do is put a little bit of olive oil. And I, I didn't realize this, but the, this whole issue about the smoke point of olive oil, eh, it's all kind of crap. I mean, you can cook olive oil at a, any reasonable temperature is fine. And in fact, fun right? fact, it is actually the least oxidizable of any oil exactly 
even it's even better than coconut oil. And I know. Yeah, yeah, and the smoke point has nothing to do. Everybody to do says, oh, it. it's oxidizing. No, it's horrible. No, point. no, the, the, the polyphenols in the extra virgin olive oil protects the oil at heat. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, it's so it's so amazing. I want to come back to the olive oil in a second. But so, you know, I love to just put a little olive oil, put the shellfish down, yep. let them just let, and you could put a little cover on top of it and they will just pop uh, open when they're yep. done and they release their <clears throat> briny juices. Yep. So delicious. Yeah. Yeah, and, and a lot of, yeah, a la plancha, <laughs> like you say, you know, exactly. you'll see that so many places. Yeah, exactly. All right. Let's talk about olive oil because I, I noticed that, you know, I've been, I've been following you, of course, and because um, who doesn't, and there's all this information that you've been talking about olive oil. How did you get into olive oil? Well, uh, one of my expressions from long ago is the only purpose of food is to get olive oil in your mouth. And that was actually based on looking at very long lived cultures, particularly in the Mediterranean. Yeah. And, and some of these cultures use a liter of olive oil per week, uh, which is about 10 to 12 tablespoons a day. And there's been several very good olive oil studies. I think the best one was the Predimed study where, um, and I think that that's a, I thought it was a very well designed study. You know, maybe that's we could a, argue about it. From, but that's a study from Spain. Spain. <clears throat> that looked at how people actually live their lives and eat their food, but they designed it to really track um, the diet by categories of ingredients, including olive oil. And then they looked at important health outcomes that we all care about, and then they found the patterns. So what, what, what patterns do you think people need to know about from about olive oil? What, what's good about it? Well, you know, they looked at multiple patterns and they basically took 65 year old in, year old individuals who had coronary artery disease. And they made one group use a liter of olive oil per week. And they actually made people bring their you know, jar or bottle. Empty. Yeah, the empty one and exchange it at the, at the clinic, uh, which is you know, better control than a lot of experimental studies. And they followed them for five years. And the original plan was just to look at coronary disease. And there was actually a tremendous benefit in lessening a new uh, event from the olive oil group. But then one of the things that really caught my eye, uh, they had lots of little sub variants that they published on. One that caught my eye was memory. And the olive oil group at the end of five years actually had improved memory compared to when they started at age 65. Wow. Yeah. Here you go. That's better. That's better. That's better than before, not less worse. Exactly. And the other group were worse. You know, they were worse, which one would expect. Okay, they're now 70 okay. and blah, right. blah, blah. But better, you know, five yeah. years on, it's that, like, you know what that that's like lengthening telomeres as opposed to just slowing them down. Yeah, like, exactly. Exactly. Like like you know, and and you know. As you know, one of the things that you and I share in common is that, like, you know, our background is in like serious hardcore research for you at the NIH. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and, you know, we don't expect as biologists doing medical research to see reversal or improvement from baseline. Our, our training shows us in disease models that, you know, kind of the best we can hope for is less bad slowing things down. Like that's the expectation of science. But when, like what you were just describing, when we see something improving, that means that we got to pay attention to what's going on. Yeah, it, that's exactly right. And so, so then of course you go, all right, oleic acid, which is, you know, the major monounsaturated fat in olive oil, isn't particularly interesting as a fat. It's a monounsaturated fat. And I had the pleasure a few years ago of talking to the head of the olive oil council in, in Italy, who's a physician. And he says, you know, it's not a particularly interesting fat, but it's what it's carrying. That's what we're realizing, you know, all these polyphenols, that it's just an agent to get polyphenols it's delivered a, into it's you. A, it's a carrier. It's a carrier. And he right. says, we, we, we forget about oleic acid. Yeah, it's in lots of other stuff too. But it, Hydroxytyrosol? You know, yeah, hydroxytyrosol. Um, so so here's, what you're, here's what you just said. Food is just a carrier for olive oil. 
<laughs> olive exactly. oil is just a carrier for polyphenols exactly. like hydroxytyrosol. <laughs> yeah, and there, you know, and there's multiple other ones. I, I, that's, that's like yeah. the that's like the Russian doll, right? So basically, yeah. uh, it's a, a Trojan horse of goodness delivering the polyphenols. So that is really truly amazing. So, do you have your own olive oil now? Is that what you did? Well, yeah, that, that is a fascinating story. Um, we got. It's, it's, it's a great story. You'll love this. Uh, it goes right up our alley. So uh, you, you and I know that in general, great wines come from stressed vines. Um, yeah. They are in rock, they're underwater, they're often at high elevation, exposed to sunlight. And the more the plant is stressed, the more polyphenols that the right. plant uses to protect itself and its grapes. And so there's a, there's a young man by the name of Othman who lives in Morocco, whose family is fourth generation olive oil producers. They actually own a million two hundred thousand olive trees. And his, he, he's a wine snob and he approached his father and he says, you know, I'll bet you that olives would respond to the same stresses that grapes are. And I bet you we could get a much higher polyphenol content in olives if we stressed them. And he said, would you let me do it? And the so, day wait, I said, how did, so, how, so how did he stress them? Oh, how did so he, do it? he goes out in the middle of the Moroccan desert, finds rock, and it's near the Atlas Mountains, and it's really hot. So he plants the olive trees in rows, just wow. like vines, rather wow. than, yeah. And he grows them in rows like vines. He grows them in rock. He underwaters them. It's hot in the rock and desert. And yeah. so it, it takes five years to get a crop. And I mean, it's, such a, it's actually a great story. So he, he gets his olive oil press yeah. and he takes it into the local olive oil guy, gets it pressed. He takes it to his dad and he says, Dad, you know, look at this. This is great. And his dad tastes it. And he says, This is horrible. This isn't even extra virgin olive oil. Son, you're a failure. So he takes it to the local certification guy and he certifies it as extra virgin. He says, but you know, this is really interesting stuff. Mm. He said, would you mind if we send it up to Paris to the analyze olive oil? It? Yeah, to analyze it. And so he gets a call from Paris a couple of weeks later. He says, hey, are you the guy with the olive oil from yeah, Morocco? Yeah, yeah, he said, yeah, yeah. yeah me. He says, what the heck are you doing? This stuff has 30 times more polyphenols than we've ever tested in ever in any olive oil. What the heck Ooh. are you doing? So, so that's the so that's the mic drop, right? Yeah. So basically, the 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 lab in Paris that had no skin in the game had no idea what was being said. It was a blinded blinded, test, yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. Just came up with a number and they know what all the other numbers look like for regular olive oils they test. Correct. And they found something different. So what about the taste? What is it? What was the. Well, uh, it, and, and he, so anyhow, so his dad said, OK, smart guy, you did it. But who's going to buy this? And so that's you. <laughs> that's me. So I get it. I literally get a cold call from this guy because he had been at a trade show in okay. in France. And he was telling him about this. He says, you know, I did it, but who wants this? He says, you know, there's a guy that you need to look up and he's Dr. Gundry because he's uh, a nut about polyphenols. So I get a cold call from this nice young man. And the next thing I know, I'm in a plane over to Morocco. I'm going, oh, I, wow. I, I got to see this for myself. And it, yeah. So, and then I saw his production process and he, he presses actually in the fields. It's a, it's a great story. So I said, done deal. I'll take it. And wow. And now it's actually one of our biggest selling products. What, what is it? Can you hold it up? Let me, look, can I, can I see? Yeah. So what, it's, do you have a polyphenol high? Yeah. It's poly, called polyphenol, polyphenol high. rich olive oil from Gundry okay. MD. And wow. it, I, I got to get you some. And I, I, the, Fantastic. And so the cool thing about this is, all right, so you're supposed to have a liter of olive oil per week. The polyphenols in here, all you need is a tablespoon a day. Anybody to get, can do that. Anybody can do that. So you can, you know, you can have it as a shot. You can put it on your salad. You, it's easy to do. And uh, so my job is to get olive oil into people. And if 
just a tablespoon will get you the hydroxytyrosol that would be in, you know, um, a is, liter. Can I, can I ask you, what is the varietal's name that they planted? Do you happen to know that? I don't know it off the top of my head, but now you've got me curious. I, I'm sure I know it or knew it, but it's one of those things that left. Well, my... you know, the, the, the reason is that there have been some really nice studies looking at high polyphenol, like within the Mediterranean, the highest polyphenol uh, monovarietals. And they found that Corneki in the Peloponnesus, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Picuau in Spain, and yeah. Moriolo in Umbria all have, you know, markedly higher levels. So sort of the, the best of the best. But it would be really interesting if they planted those naturally high polyphenol monovarietals and stuck them in the desert. So yeah. would you find, would you I'll, find I'll out find out. the varietals? Yeah, I will I mean, find out. That we, we that's, should, e let's, that's easy to do. Let's um let's do that. In fact, it'd be a lot of fun to actually even collaborate on um maybe a maybe like a comparative research study. We can find some other olive oils and just kind of see what the graph looks like. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, that that would be an, an awful lot of fun that you do with you. Okay, so listen, um, I I know your time is so valuable. I, I thank you so Here's much for having this conversation. Tell me about um where where can people find out more about you? your olive oil, your amazing books, like where do we go? Where do people go? Well, you can go to drgundry.com. You can go to my uh, supplement and food company, gundrymd.com. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook. I've got two uh, YouTube channels. You can find me on the Dr. Gundry podcast. We've had the pleasure of having you there and um, vice versa. And yeah. so, and you can get books wherever books are sold, but please go to your local bookseller. They were decimated during COVID and anything we can do to keep them alive is greatly appreciated. Yeah. And that goes back to that generation's old traditions, right? Like where books, you know, by the way, an interesting thing is like a printed book can last for thousands of years. Um, you know, a CD only lasts like 15 years and you know something on a flash drive is even shorter so you know go back to the basics and i think the 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 people that sell these books are are so they're they're precious people in our society we've got to kind of keep them kind of keep them going well well that's great and um listen and and you know i'm big passion for food and health and polyphenols and olive oil and so for anybody who wants to actually get more information about food and, uh, as medicine and food and health, um, please come to my website. It's Dr. William Lee, Dr. Dr. William Lee, L -I .com. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok. Um, I, you know, I, I got one and I got more than a million views on one of the videos from my TikToks. Like, who would have thought? But yeah, I know. I'm I'm trending on TikTok now. It's like really, it's, it's amazing. It's it's, like, ama it's, it's yeah. quite amazing. But you know, like I think what's amazing is that it's because someone like you, like the stuff that we were just talking about, like that's that's the stuff that is not just fun and it's not funny, but it's really valuable for people to have. And you know, it's like that light bulb going off your head. Hey, if I planted olives in the Moroccan desert and it actually has, you know, huge numbers of polyphenols, like that's a, that's a good little tip, but please come to my website, sign up for um, my newsletter. You can find out uh, about master classes that I give. I've actually done an online course to really help people do a deep dive if they're really interested in this. And I mean, and you know, what I love about just our conversation uh, Dr. Gundry is that, you know, we're kindred spirits. We're both researchers. We're both doctors. We were created out of that same factory that pumps out MDs. And yet, you know, like we went and did something a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. And, and listen, and a lot of people don't know this, but uh, your birthday is July 11th. And it happens to be National Polyphenol Day, right? It so is. I, I, I want people to take a shot of olive oil. Uh, uh, which I have here. I'm going to do, I'm going to toast you in advance and, um, and then use a hashtag, which is a hashtag national polyphenol day tag you on social media. And um, we should actually toast to longevity and good health. Yeah. And cheers. what better way with polyphenols and olive oil. Cheers. Hey, here's you. Cheers. Ah, thank you very much. We'll see hey. you again soon. Thanks for having me. Good to see you again. Take, take care. Bye-bye.